and that will expose, you know, right now we're able to finance the debt uh, because we're able to sell short-term uh, notes at very, very low rates of interest. So it's like this, you know, $1.5 trillion a year deficit is financeable only as long as short-term rates are extremely low. And every year, I think in the next year, I think, I know, I think the government has to sell and refinance 5 or $6 trillion worth of debt. And, you know, the fact that they can do that in the Tigo market at next to no rate of interest, that's what makes it affordable. But if we get a big spike up in interest rates, uh, the debt is no longer affordable. And then either we need to default uh, or, or print. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that they're going to choose a printing. And, you know, a catalyst that could bring that to the head would be something out of China. Maybe China comes up and revalues the RMB significantly higher versus the dollar or allows the RMB to appreciate uh, you know, more rapidly and therefore uh, the R Chinese no longer have to buy as many treasuries. And if the RMB starts to rise, then other currencies in Southeast Asia will be able to rise. So their governments won't have to buy as many treasuries. And so you have a situation where the deficit is running out of control, yet the biggest buyers are no longer in the market. In fact, they may turn into sellers themselves. Uh, so that, you know, you've also got uh, the Social Security ticking time bomb. You know, Social Security right now is uh, running at a deficit. So the Social Security Administration is now having to sell bonds out of the so-called trust funds into the market in order to finance the difference between what the government is paying out in benefits and what they're collecting in taxes. That is going to accelerate potentially into a crisis in the next year or two. And are we going to have a significant tax hike uh, to shore that up, or are we just going to? And of course, if there is a significant tax hike, that'll be very depressed, have a very depressing effect on the economy. So, you know, we there's so many different pins that can prick the bubble, but you know, it, it's going to find one of them. So, do you think there's a, all these factors could combine into another type of perfect storm that we saw in? Uh, in 2008 and 2009 when everything just kind of kind of came together and fell apart at once or is, is it just going to like, yeah, like I mean, one thing the after another? Yeah, I worse shape now than it was uh, going into the last class crash. And, you know, I think that a lot of the fallout, you know, so far has, uh, you know, the, the pain has been uh, postponed. Uh, and so we're still going to have to endure it because we're deeper in debt now. The government is more involved in the economy than it was a couple of years ago. It's, it's causing even bigger problems. So you know we're this is this is we're still early in this process. You know, I people talk about a double dip recession, and I keep saying it's not a question of a double dip. We're in a depression, and yes, within a depression you have periods of time where the economy expands, but it's you know it's over a longer period of time uh, the expansions are short lived and the contractions you know continue repeating. You know, just like during the 1930s, there were plenty of quarters of positive GDP growth. In fact, in 1931. Nobody realized that they were living in a Great Depression. In fact, the government was still saying that prosperity was just around the corner, yet the entire depression still lied ahead. And I think that's the situation where we're in now. We never really recovered. All we did is go deeper into debt to spend more money, which simply exacerbated the problems that underlie our economy. And so we're in more trouble. And I think that the risk this time around with this depression is going to be that it will more likely be an inflationary depression where the cost of living goes up instead of down, which is, you know, really, uh, you know, compounding the problems. It's like, you know, getting kicked in the groin when you're already lying on the ground. You know, during the 1930s, even if you lost money in the stock market, even if your house lost value, at least it was cheaper to eat. At least energy was cheaper. At least clothing was less expensive. You know, as you, the cost of living went down, so you didn't need as much money because it wasn't as expensive to live. And, of course, if you didn't lose your job, you know, say that was great because your wages didn't necessarily crash, but the, 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 your cost of living did. But during this depression, you know, it's going to be very different. Not only are you going to see your house, your house is going to go down in value and your stock portfolio is going to go down, but your grocery bills are going to go up. Your energy bills are going to go up. And, and so even if you have a job, you know, your, your paycheck's not going to go as far. And if you're unemployed, well, now it's even worse because <laughs> not only don't you have a job, but, you know, it costs you so much more to survive. Yeah, and uh, it doesn't look like we're going to have uh, any any type of World War II to to bring us out of that uh, this time around either. Well, remember that's a myth. You see, World yeah, War II didn't get us out of the depression. We got out of the depression despite having to fight World War II. I mean, if we have to fight a war, if we have to if we have to increase 
our military spending, it's just going to make it that much worse because any resources that we use to fight a war are resources that are not available to grow the economy. So, you know, let's just hope and pray that we don't have a, a yeah. war, uh, you know, not only because of, because of the loss of life and the problems there, but we cannot afford a war when we're broke. We can't even afford the peace that we have today. The, the amount of money we're already spending on, on, on military around the world is bankrupting us. We can't, you know, we can't afford it, anything, anything to go wrong. Yeah, I mean, we we can barely afford uh, what's going going on in the Middle East right now. I mean, I just can't even imagine the kind of spending that would be involved in a, another type of worldwide conflict uh, uh, on oh, the scale yeah, of the 1940s. Possible. Yeah. Um, now, here's here's a question that came in from one of uh, Ben Zinga's readers. Her name is Courtney. Uh, she writes, I am a 26-year-old single female working professional. Uh, from an economic perspective, what, if anything, do I have to look forward to in the future? Well, it, a lot of that depends on, you know, the path that we take as a nation and the policies that we pursue. I mean, you know, I'm running for the United States Senate. I know it's kind of a long shot at this point. I mean, I first I have to get on the ballot. I, I submitted what should be enough signatures, so hopefully uh, I will be out candidate and maybe I can beat William McMahon and then maybe I can get elected to the Senate. But if I can help uh, change the course of Washington that we're on, right now we're, you know, we're marching you know, down Hayek's Road to serfdom, and, you know, we're almost there. You know, but if I can somehow build a fork in that road and make sure that we that we veer onto the onto the right path, you know, if we can start dismantling uh, the enormous government that we've erected over the years, if we can start repealing rules and regulations, and and letting free market forces once again allocate resources in this economy and determine which companies survive and which fail, uh, you know, if we can uh, cut government spending enough, if we can abolish enough agencies and departments, so that we can uh, reform and reduce taxes in this country on, on hard work and productions, on savings and investments. You know, we have a bright future, and there's a lot to be optimistic about. If, on the other hand, we don't do that, if we continue uh, to move along in this direction, uh, getting government more involved in economic decisions, uh, more involved in the economy, uh, continuing, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to have uh, bureaucrats uh, and, 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 uh, and legislators you know, make these key decisions and increase taxes and increase spending, then, you know, there is no opportunity in this country. Uh, but the good news is that there is opportunities in other countries. And, you know, just like my grandparents left Eastern Europe and, and came to America and had great lives and raised my, you know, my father and his seven sisters and, uh, you know, all four of my grandparents emigrated from other countries and and had very uh, fulfilling, prosperous lives and had lots of children, uh, you know, Americans can do the same thing, you know. Uh, and, you know, there's other opportunities that people want to succeed, and if they want to work hard, uh, they can leave the country, and they can, you know, pursue their, their dreams someplace else. That's an unfortunate development if it happens, and it's very sad for this country. But, you know, individuals you know, need to make decisions and do what's, what's in their own self-interest. And if it means emigrating to another country, then that's what it means. You know? now, now, speaking of, of foreign countries, I, I mean, given the big problems with a lot of foreign uh, economies, with, uh, uh, such as Greece, for example, uh, do you think that investing in international stocks and, and asset classes is, is still the way to go? Um, yeah, if so, what well, stocks I mean, and asset classes would you recommend to your clients? 